So um, here's, here's the thing. Um, you know, when I, I talk to people about um, public speaking and stuff, I tell them, don't ever do this. Don't ever get up in front of people and tell them that you're terrified. Because then all they're gonna do is look at you to see how scared you really are. Well, this is, this is right along those same lines. I, I, would, I would tell somebody, don't ever do what I'm about to do. So that tells you something about me, I guess, I don't know. Um, but I, I want you to understand something. Um, so not sleeping good on Saturday nights isn't that unusual for me. Um, but getting next to no sleep at all is very, very difficult. And so just being honest with you, I probably maybe halfway kind of fell asleep and tossed and turned, but have been up since 2.30 this morning and, and had the first service and preached and did what I did. And I'm just telling you, like, I'm exhausted right now. Uh, my, my eyes feel puffy. Like, I, if you're looking at me going, well, what's wrong with Pastor Steve? That's what's wrong with me. I'm tired. I, I can't wait for this to be over. In fact, if someone <laughs> said amen, that would be great. I want to go home and eat and crawl in my chair with my stupid blanket and, and just be, have it be over with. It'd be just fine. Um, but I, I don't want you to misunderstand uh, what you might be seeing. I'm fine. I'm just tired. And uh, I, I'm going to attempt to do something this morning that in my right mind, and if I wasn't tired, would be crazy. And it's, so it's even crazier to try it this morning, which is my way of saying I cannot be held accountable for anything I'm about to <laughs> preach this morning. I said some stuff in first service, I'm guessing that probably ran off at least 100 people. We'll see if we can double that this service, I don't know. So here we go, we're in week five of the armor of God, and after a seriously in-depth introduction to um, the armor of God, you know, we, we, we spent so many, with three and a half weeks really just talking about spiritual warfare and the reality of it, and some of the different components to it. And then last week, we finally, at the end of the sermon, got to the first part of talking about the first thing that's listed as the armor of God, which is to gird our loins or cover our loins with truth. Uh, the first part of our armor is truth, because if it's not truth, if we don't start in the place of truth, everything thereafter is a nightmare. It's a mix of truth and error all the way to full-on deception. The first and most important thing we must understand and have on is truth. Now, I find it interesting that it is this, um, uh, the, to cover our, our, um, our loins with truth. We talked about the importance of, of our loins are our reproductive parts and how important it is just to reproduce truth in your own heart, in your own mind constantly, how important it is to share truth with other people because as we arm ourselves with the truth of God and reproduce it in and through our lives, that's how we defeat the enemy's lies. It is by the truth of God. Now, is he lying all the time? You better believe it. Jesus said he's the father of lies. If he's talking, he's lying or at least he's deceiving. He's a liar from the very beginning and how we combat that is with the truth of God. So that's what we talked about last week. Now today, <laughs> we're gonna try to cover the next three pieces of armor in one message. Somebody stop me. <laughs> Don't try to do this at home. I'm a paid professional and it would be disastrous. Today I wanna to talk to you about the breastplate of righteousness. I wanna talk about having your feet covered with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then finally, I wanna to talk to you about the shield of faith. Open your Bibles this morning to Ephesians chapter six and verse 14. Paul says, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. All right, first, the breastplate of righteousness. When it comes to us talking about righteousness, there's two different types of righteousness that we need to understand. There is that righteousness that we call imputed righteousness. 
It is righteousness that God just gives us and places on our lives and says, this is yours and this is who you are, regardless of the fact that you didn't do anything to earn it. Imputed righteousness. It is the kind of righteousness we see in 2 Corinthians 5.21. Paul writes and says, for God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, so that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ. So this is this imputed righteousness. God took Jesus who knew no sin, he became sin for us, and then we received through what Jesus did the righteousness of God. It's righteousness that's imputed to us. That is something that we need to believe. It's part of our identity. We are the righteousness of God in Christ, imputed righteousness. Now, next is what I would just call practical righteousness. This is what many of us would be more familiar with. Practical righteousness is just that righteousness that we know and understand and discern. It's us looking at various circumstances or situation and going, that's right, that's wrong. That's righteous, that's unrighteous. It's just practical righteousness. It's just looking at things through the lens of God's filter. So when we talk about the breastplate of righteousness, we need to know that it's talking about imputed righteousness and practical righteousness. Now, the breastplate of righteousness Think about it for a minute, a breastplate. What what would a breastplate cover on your life? What would be the most vital thing if it was covering your torso, what would be the most vital thing a breastplate would cover? Good job, Bible scholars. Your heart, absolutely. Now, what is the issue? Why is it so important to guard your heart? King Solomon, in all of his wisdom, tells us in Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart. It literally means, AJ, to guard your heart. Keep your heart with all diligence. It means pay attention to this. For out of it, out of your heart, spring the very issues of life. The reason we need the breastplate of righteousness is because our heart needs to be protected because out of our heart spring the very issues of our life. What we think, what we say, what we do, it is all a byproduct of what is going on, beloved, in our hearts. Now I wanna show you these two different passages of scripture, very, very important. Jesus here is talking to the Pharisees and it's a very sobering conversation. Matthew chapter 12, verses 34 and 35. Jesus says to them, brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. But an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil things. Jesus makes it abundantly clear that what is going on in our heart is going to surface through our words and through our actions. You cannot sow unrighteousness into your heart and have righteousness come out. It doesn't work that way. Garbage in, garbage out, right? We've said that forever. This is a biblical reality. So Paul's saying this, you've got to put on the breastplate of righteousness to protect the righteousness that God has imputed into your heart. Don't let that get stolen. Don't let the enemy take that away. But also put on the breastplate of righteousness to protect your heart from being assaulted by the unrighteousness that is in this world. Has anybody in the room on the campus, in, on the net, has anybody figured out that there is a, an onslaught of unrighteousness coming against the people of God? Like, have you figured that out yet? It's very, very real. And apart from the breastplate of righteousness covering us from this onslaught, we're gonna be in trouble, friends. We're gonna be cooked, and then what happens is our life becomes destroyed. Our life gets marginalized and minimized by the unrighteous 
production of what's going on internally inside of us. Jesus said without question, from the abundance of your house, your your mouth is gonna speak. You got good treasure in there, you're gonna bring forth good things. You got evil treasure in there because you've allowed unrighteousness, unrighteous uh, wickedness is gonna come out. Just expound on this just a little bit more. Matthew 15, 18 through 20. Jesus again speaking to the Pharisees, he says, those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. Almost identical to what he just said. But look what they do. They defile a man. I want you to remember that. It's very strong language. These things defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands, that doesn't defile a man. What's the Pharisees' problem? They weren't interested at all with heart issues. They weren't interested with the breastplate of righteousness. They were only interested in religious behavior that looked good in front of other people, but they let wickedness have its place in their hearts, and Jesus calls them out on it. Why is he calling them out? Because again, what's going on in there is gonna come out in words and actions. And Paul says, because of that, you gotta protect yourself. Protect what God has done in you and don't let the enemy have his way from outside of you. Now friends, I guess there's a million things that we could point at, but let me just go after a couple cultural icons. I, I, I fear that some might even think that this is some kind of fiery, old, condemning holiness message. Maybe it needs to be. So, are you ready? Here we go. This is one that I've, I've picked on over the years and it, it still stays on TV. It means people watch it like crazy. I just don't know what the unrighteous fascination is with The Bachelor. And the bachelorette. Now here, let's, do, let's think about this. I mean, we need to laugh, otherwise we're gonna start crying, right? Why don't you think about this? So I'm, I'm going to set myself up here, and here's what I wanna watch. I wanna watch absolute strangers get hooked up with a multiplicity of partners and, and I want to watch them and hear about their sexual escapades in the jacuzzi or on the kitchen, wherever, and I, I'm going to give myself to that. And I'm going to give myself to that over and over and over again until it comes to the grand finale. And I just, like, I'm going to have a dinner party and have friends over because we've just got to see who wins. Can I tell you, there is no winner. They're all losers. There is no winner. Everything about it is unrighteous, unholy, godless, sinful wickedness. But what happens is we have become so cultured by unrighteousness, we don't even, we don't even care. It doesn't even matter. We, we just give ourselves to these things. The scripture says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Protect who God says you are. Protect your heart from the onslaughts of the enemy. Because if there's unrighteousness coming in, there's unrighteousness gonna come out. If you think you're gonna give yourselves to these things and be unscathed, you're already deceived. If you already think, oh, it doesn't matter, oh, it's just fun, oh, it's just this, or oh, it's just that, he's already got you. This, this would be just a great kind of litmus test just to say, next time you want to sit down and, and give yourself over to these things that are ungodly, regardless of what it might be, I, I just want you to picture yourself saying, hey, Jesus, will you come over here and just watch this with me? Let's have a good time together. 
and see if he just didn't say, I'm watching that. What are you talking about? I haven't called you to that. The breastplate of righteousness. This isn't legalism, friends. This is holiness. This, this is what God has called us to. Let me tell you how confused I think, not just society, the church is. I'm gonna blame this on being tired, but let me just keep going since I'm already in trouble. <laughs> so Sarah and I are watching HDTV or whatever it was, one of those stations the other day. And, and this commercial comes on about these different people coming together and, and kissing. So we're, I'm watching it going, like, I just, I just want to watch HGTV. But there's these people that come out and, like, they meet for the first time. It's some new show. And it's, it was something about love at first kiss or kiss, something like that. So they bring these two total strangers out and, and meet them in a room. And the first thing they do, apparently is get involved in some huge, passionate, groping, everywhere kiss to see if there's love there. <laughs> to see if there's love there. And I, I watched it, Sarah and I looked at each other and just went, what, what in the world? It came on again about 10 minutes later, like they're pushing this really hard. And Sarah goes, look at there's, there's two women. I'm guessing there'll probably be two men next or maybe already there, I don't know. But I'm just watching it going, what, what, like what in the world? And then I'm thinking, how many followers of Jesus are, are gonna sit and watch this? Because the producer of the show is a well-known follower of Jesus. Yeah. Does Jesus TV shows. And I go, like, how confused are we getting here? Like, we have completely taken off our breastplate of righteousness and saying we'll receive any kind of unrighteousness and we'll keep dancing and raising our hands the whole time. I think this is the kind of stuff where God says, with your lips you praise me, but your hearts are far from me. Friends, this isn't, this isn't self-righteous meanness. This is like obeying God in living in righteous holiness and pursuing him. Putting on the breastplate of righteousness. Protecting your heart. Because out of your heart flow the issues of life itself. Breastplate of righteousness protects who you are, allows good things to come out of you. It guards your heart against temptation and sin and getting hardened and jaded but in a very slow process. It prevents unrighteous footholds from beginning to rule your heart. It, it keeps you from getting spiritually deadened and callous and hardened to just the onslaught of unrighteousness in this world. Not guarding your heart. There's gonna be unrighteousness going on. It's gonna come out eventually because we're yielding ourselves to temptation and sin. We, we end up in the process, as Jesus himself said twice, we end up defiling ourselves. Becoming, it means to become unclean. Like it's, it's really serious, strong language. I don't wanna defile myself. I want to give myself to unrighteousness while saying I believe in the righteousness of God or preaching righteousness. I want to live that double standard. I want to produce TV shows talking about the greatness of Jesus and having people hook up on TV so that we can be entertained by it and just wonder if there'll be love at first kiss. It's ridiculous. The breastplate of righteousness the breastplate of righteousness would ask every potential heart suitor that would come to us and offer our hearts something. The breastplate of righteousness would ask every heart suitor, how is what you're offering me lining up 
with the will and the word and the ways of God. I learned decades ago when temptation comes my way and things try to beguile me and cause me to compromise and sin and participate in unrighteousness, I learned a long time ago to say to that devil, that is not the will of God in Christ Jesus for my life. I've said it for decades. It hasn't made me perfect, but it's kept me out of a lot of trouble. That's what the breastplate of righteousness does. It says to the would-be suitor, what are you offering me? And how does it line up with the will of God for me? Oh, well, it doesn't really line up with the will of God, but, but it is about love <laughs> or lust. Yeah. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. All right, our next piece of armor. Anybody want to keep going? Ephesians 6, 15, Paul says, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I want to talk to you about preparing yourself to stand in God's prevailing peace. You have to prepare yourself to stand in God's prevailing peace. It isn't just going to happen. And we are able to stand in God's prevailing peace even in a world that is going madder and sicker by the moment. Look at what Jesus said in John 14, 27. He said, peace I leave you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be afraid. Jesus has given us peace, first of all. Like, if we're gonna, if we're gonna prepare our hearts, we gotta know that. Jesus has peace for us, he really does. It means a courageous calm. It means a quiet and a rest. Jesus has that for us. He's left it for us. He's given that to us. We've got to know that. We've got to receive it. Believe it and receive it. Jesus, okay, you said I can have a quiet confidence, a courageous calm. Okay, Jesus, I receive that from you. I receive that from you. And it's not in the way, he said, it's not like the peace that the world gives. What the peace the world gives is situational peace. If everything's okay, then you feel good and have peace. Jesus said, that's not the kind of peace I have for you. The kind of peace I have for you is a peace that lasts and endures, that regardless of what's going on in the world, you can have courageous calm. Jesus' peace, it allows us to not be troubled or afraid when things are storm-tossed, when things hit rock bottom. We're gonna see in a few minutes Jesus' peace, the peace that he gives, it surpasses understanding. It is, there's nothing natural about it. It is supernatural. It is otherworldly. It's not restricted by the confines of natural logic. He gives it. It's ours to receive. What else he said? John 16, 32 and 33. Jesus said to his disciples, indeed the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me, Jesus said, you can have peace. In the world you're gonna have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. It's amazing. Jesus' peace, that courage and comfort in a world of tribulation, it all comes again by knowing that Jesus has overcome this broken, worldly, wicked way. It's understanding that he offers us something from above that is beyond, again, the low-level living of this world. It's bigger and greater and grander and isn't dependent upon things all working out here. It, it is the peace of God that moves apostles while they're in prison and in chains to begin to worship at midnight and glorify God even though they're imprisoned. That's the peace of God. That's what's available. Paul says, prepare yourselves to walk in this peace, to receive this peace, to operate in this peace. There 
There's turmoil right now. There's turmoil all around the world. There's a lot of turmoil right here in our country. It didn't get better when the primaries were over. <laughs> it's not gonna get better in the general election. And it's not gonna get better after we have a new president, whoever that is. Followers of Jesus, may I plead with you to prepare your hearts to walk in the prevailing peace of God. Would you allow your conduct right now, before November and after January, to reflect the peace of God? So important. There's not enough peace right now in the church. There needs to be peace. There needs to be a revolution of peace in the hearts of God's people. Get it from Jesus. He offers it. And it's not situational or circumstantial. It is eternal. How can you prepare your hearts a little more? Paul says, Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing. Look at this, friends but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and what? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts, there it is right there, the breastplate of righteousness, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true and noble and just and pure and lovely, things that are of a good report, if there's anything virtuous or praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Reproduce these things. Let the truth of these things constantly, continually be going through your spirit. Paul says, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, just do these things. And here's what'll happen. The God of peace will be with you. You want to prepare your heart to walk in peace? Know that it's real, receive it, believe it, of course. Realize that it's bigger than what the world has to offer, of course. But friends, the peace of God predominantly is gonna come through praying, making your requests known to God, whatever it is that's getting you weirded out. Go ahead and talk about it. His shoulders are big enough. But then with prayer and thanksgiving, which means simply, God, this, this is what has me distracted, worked up, terrified, troubled, anxious, horrified. But, but, I thank you because I know you're in control. I thank you because you have declared yourself, Jesus, to be the Prince of Peace that you offer peace. And Lord, I'm gonna meditate and think on that for a while. I'm gonna think about how much you love me. I'm gonna think about how much you care for me, how much you've promised to never leave or forsake me, that you're gonna stick closer than a brother with me. You're gonna walk with me through it all, whatever it is. And Lord, with prayer and thanksgiving, I'm gonna thank you and praise you. I'm gonna meditate, Lord, on things that are true and noble and just, things that are lovely and praiseworthy and of a good report. God, I'm gonna meditate on those things. And see, friends, as we begin to pray with thanksgiving like that, what happens? Paul says the very God of peace comes right into our situation. I know in my own life, I wish I could tell you I have this all figured out and I get it right every time. My wife will tell you different. I know in my life when I lack peace the most, 
Al, you could finish the sentence. Jonathan, any, any mature believer. When I'm lacking peace the most, you know what's not happening? Prayer, thanksgiving, and meditation on what's right. I'm not preparing myself to walk in the peace of God. I'm allowing myself to be battered by the enemy. And then all of a sudden I wake up a little bit and go, man, Fred, what's going on? I gotta cover my feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace and start standing in the peace of God. Yes, and it's bigger than my understanding. It surpasses understanding. I find myself standing in the peace of God. It's mind blowing. You gotta kind of pinch yourself every once in a while and go, I should be losing it right now, but I feel pretty good. You laugh because you know that's true. You're staring at hell's flames and you've got a squirt gun and you're all right. <laughs> that's the peace of God. just remind you really quickly, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. One of the byproducts of the, the working of the Holy Spirit in your life is peace. Again, ask him for it. He gives it. He offers it. Get it. Maintain it through prayer and thanksgiving and meditating on what's good. Turn the TV off. Stop watching the news, which is old's. There's nothing new about it. Get off Facebook. Shut down your Twitter account. If these things are stealing, killing, and destroying you, donezo. Get peace. Standing in the prevailing peace of God delivers us from trouble, fear, and anxiety, and it produces peace, courage, and comfort. Stand in the peace of God. Our next piece of armor, finally, Ephesians 6.16, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. I wanna talk to you quickly about the shield of faith. Typically, when we talk about the shield of faith, we talk about faith and we kind of leave the shield undone. We may make some application of, well now which shield, Roman shield is this? Is it kind of the wrong round one, the gladiator one, or is it the one that's rectangular and kind of like the size of a door that you have? And we just kind of you know, talk briefly about that and then get into the issue and the importance of faith. Faith is important, but I looked at it differently this time, and I found something fascinating out. Lisa, listen to this, you're gonna love this. No less than 19 times in the scripture does God himself say, I'm your shield. Friends, this isn't about a Roman shield. This is about the king of the universe saying, I'm your shield. Yes. Don't discredit me by comparing me to some leather strap piece of Roman wood. I'm your shield, the great I am, the almighty one the ruler of heaven and earth, I'm your shield. And so he tells Abram in Genesis chapter 15 all the way back in the beginning. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram, I'm your shield. It's the first place he said it. And I'm your exceedingly great reward. You progress through the, the scriptures, we get to this prophetic psalm of Jesus in Psalm 84 verses nine and 11. Look at this. Oh God, Behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. What's the psalmist saying? God, we want you to look at who our shield is. In fact, he's none other than the anointed one himself. Jesus is our shield. The father of creation is our shield. And then it goes on in verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. God is our shield. Because he's our shield. And because he says it so many times, I, I can't help but think that he's not just making this personal. Saying to his beloved, to his bride, to his children, 
I want you to understand, I take this issue of being your safety, your security. I take this issue personally. I'm your shield. Pick me up, get behind me, and let me be your first line of defense. He's our shield. Get to Psalm 115, verse 9 through 11. Oh, Israel, trust in the Lord. He's their help and their shield. Oh, house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He's their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He's their help and their shield. Do you think God's trying to get it across to us that he's our shield? Because he's our shield, then what's the exhortation? Trust him, trust him, trust him, have faith. This is the shield of faith. This is faith in the shield, it's both. It's, it's, not, it's not just faith in some object. It's faith in a person. It's faith in the Almighty. And so Paul says, take up the shield of faith. Take it up with trust. Take up who God is, who God says you are. His promises and his power to you. Take up the shield. Friends, the the issue that we face isn't whether the shield is strong enough. The shield is God. The issue is, will we pick it up and put him out there? I want him in front of me. I want my captain to go before me. I'm gonna walk in faith in who he is, what he says, who he says I am, what he says is available to me, I'm putting that out there. And then, when he's out there like that, look at what it says next. Then you're gonna be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Then you will be able to. Then, they're fiery, they're hellish, they're they're burning, they're destructive, they're fiery darts. But they're darts, they're arrows, which means that they are secret and stealthy and quiet. They're they're arrows that come out of nowhere. Have you ever been hit by an arrow? Has an arrow ever buzzed over your head? Something so out of nowhere where you went, what in the world? What in the world? Now you know what in the world. They are the fiery darts of the wicked one. And don't make excuses for him. Oh, it was just a bad day. Oh, I was just having, it was just, you know, these things kind of happen. Yeah, those things do kind of happen because we live in a broken world for sure. But I'm telling you, when fiery darts come your way, they are satanic in nature. The apostle Paul says it himself. You feel things buzzing over your head or implanting themselves in your heart because you have left your breastplate of righteousness down. You need to know where that came from. Got you in the side. Not me. Not me. Take up the shield of faith. Put him before you. Believe who he is and what he offers you, the resources that are yours, and start quenching all of those fiery darts instead of letting them hit you, burn you, and destroy you. The breastplate of righteousness, back to that, covers who you are, guards against unrighteousness, infiltrating your heart, the peace of God. Jesus gave it, receive it. It's not circumstantial, it's bigger than that. It surpasses our understanding. We get it and keep it through prayer, thanksgiving, and meditation. And when we've got it, it guards our hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. The shield of faith. It is God himself who is our shield. Take him up, put him before you, believe who he is, believe what he promises, take into account what he provides for you, and start quenching all the fiery darts of the wicked one. All of these pieces of armor covering yourself, your loins with truth. The shield of faith. What else? Peace. 
have your feet covered with peace, have the breastplate of righteousness. All these things are vital components. That's why the Apostle Paul said, put on the whole armor of God. In part comes destruction, in whole comes victory. Put on the whole armor of God. I'm paying attention to what I'm reproducing. I want it to be truth. I'm covering my heart. I'm not letting unrighteousness have its way with me. And I'm not letting the righteousness of God that's mine escape me. I'm not going to let that get stolen. I'm going to walk in peace. And when I walk, I'm putting out God himself in front of me. I will not fear. I will not be defeated. I will quench every fiery dart regardless of its kind. I love the word all right there. You will quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Father, we thank you for your word. Pray that it would be strong and powerful in our lives. Lord, where any of us need to make adjustments in areas of unrighteousness, Lord, may we make those adjustments. Lord, where we're lacking peace and freaking out about circumstances and situations, Lord, may we prepare ourselves to walk in the peace of God. And Lord, when we're doubting, may we put you up and out in front. May we have faith in who you are and what you can do for us. God, we say today we are taking up the whole armor of God and we refuse to let the devil win anymore. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen, somebody. Amen. And God's people said. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm going home. <laughs> Love y'all very much. Take care.